Welcome everybody. Bitcoin Optech newsletter number 241 recap on Twitter Spaces. We'll go through introductions and announcements real quick and then we'll jump into the newsletter. I'm Mike Schmidt, contributor at Bitcoin Optech and also executive director at Brink where we're funding Bitcoin open source developers. Merch? Hi, I'm Merch. I work at Chaincode Labs on Bitcoin stuff. James? Hi, I'm James, Coin HR representative. <laughs> Greg? Hi, Greg Instagibbs, Core Lightning Engineer. Well, thank you, special guests, for joining us. The first and somewhat long news item is applicable to some thoughts that you guys have been giving on the mailing list recently. The topic is titled Alternative Design for Op Vault. And this came out of the Bitcoin Dev mailing list, and it was spawned by a post from Greg Sanders. And Greg, I think instead of me trying to summarize what you're getting at here, maybe you can kind of lay the land of what, it, you know, maybe a quick summary of Op Vault and then some of the alternative proposals, ideas that you've come up with. Yeah, so Op Vault is a targeted software proposal to get specific functionality that would be good for vault like systems. So you have your coins in a vault and you trigger an unvaulting essentially where you. It goes into kind of a purgatory where in a certain window, these coins can be swept into a recovery, kind of cold storage, or be allowed to go where it was going to go in the first place. So it's an extra step to have coins move to a point. And this allows a kind of better security model for a lot of custody setups. So the idealized functionality, like that part of it was great and people are loving it. I think there's been really solid feedback on it. But on the spec side, I found it a little difficult to follow what opcodes are doing what and when things are happening. And I felt it was partly because the functionality was templated. So I basically took a few hours, sat down and tried to split apart the functionality. So I, I took two, there's two opcodes. There's the opcode op vault and top unvault. And I, you know, I realized that it's actually doing three things. And so I said, okay, how would I do this in a little more taprooty way with three opcodes to do these specific things? they're actually doing or trying to accomplish. And that ended up in this email where I basically said, there's a recovery path and there's an, kind of a trigger path where you, know, you trigger this action to happen. And then you have the final withdrawal path. And these are actually the three functionalities you wanna capture. So I gave them like arbitrary names, but I felt it was a pretty decent improvement on the specification side. And then things kind of went from there. So AJ jumped in, Anthony Towns, and started giving his own feedback and whatever. We can talk about that more later. So I'll just pause for questions or call a commentary from James as the proposal. Yeah, James, what's your, I guess, initial response to what Greg's outlined? I don't think there's anything too controversial yet, but obviously you're the original author, so you may have some nuance to add to his initial feedback. Yeah, I think Greg nailed it. You know, when I put this proposal together, I'm not really a script interpreter specialist. You know, I've never written a spec for a software or the introduction of opcodes. And so I did it in probably, you know, sort of the most intuitive way for me. And I did it outside of a strict taproot context initially. And so when we decided to make this opcode, these opcodes taproot only, there's probably some like kind of conceptual debt that didn't get brought up to speed. And I think Greg did a really great job of kind of decomposing, you know, that. And really, I mean, like he said, this preserves the, the sort of end use characteristics of what I had proposed. It just makes it sort of more native to the mechanisms that the taproot gives us, which I think is great. And to AJ's credit, I think he had tried to articulate something like this to me privately, and he may have even done it in some post on the mailing list, but he, <laughs> I think by his own admission, he kind of couldn't quite articulate it. And so Greg really brought it home. So yeah, I think yeah. it's a, it's an improvement. Yeah. So AJ said, oh, hey, awesome. I tried to do that. I couldn't quite get it to work. I hope it works. And then he was convinced it worked. And then he made some helpful tweaks, some basic tweaks on it to clean up a bit. And then he went a little farther too. So w with my changes, I kind of made a an op code that's a lot like tap leaf, what was it, T-Love, right? Was it tap leaf update verify? Update verify, yeah. Right, so I essentially made a simple version of that, a very simple version of that. And then, because once you decompose these, op these things into these three op codes, suddenly the actual behavior becomes clear. So one of them is actually kind of like a T-Love, a simple one. And then the other one is actually, it looked a lot like check template verify, 
actually. So this final withdrawal phase, it was similar, but not quite the same. So we talked about it and basically AJ, James, and myself came to an agreement that actually check template verify is the functionality we're looking for here. So that was kind of like another thing that fell out of it. Anthony went further with it and said, what if we could make it more composable with other functionality as well? But we will pause here and if people want to ask about check template verify. Yeah, so I guess maybe it bears repeating that, you know, the initial proposal, the complexity kind of came from the fact that you can spend op vault and op unvault outputs in like two different ways. You know, one is the sort of the withdrawal flow and the other is the recovery flow. And Greg's Greg's re rework of the implementation ensures that each output is only ever spent in one way. So like when you're writing out the specification, basically the witness structure that you're providing, you know, for each opcode is going to be consistent across all usages of that opcode. And then AJ stepped in and basically said, hey, we can take, I think Greg calls it the op forward trigger opcode, and we can actually generalize that into something he calls op forward leaf update, which is actually like not to get too into the weeds, but it's a special case of op t love which you proposed earlier and so so i guess like in this discussion you've really kind of got three issues at hand number one is you know greg's conceptual rework of the implementation which i think everybody's on board with i think i'm going to spend some time reworking the implementation to, to be more t lovey but then you've got the ctv issue which i think again we're all three on board with in that the withdrawal process in the vault Basically, what you have to do is when you're triggering the withdrawal, you have to say, this withdrawal is locked to go to these outputs. So you have to have an opcode that basically advertises, hey, when this gets spent, it's definitely going into this set of outputs. And it turns out that that's just exactly what CTV does. And the version of that I had implemented actually had TXID malleability issues where you could, you know, for example, change and lock them. So anyway, long story short on that one is that I think we're all three in agreement that basically it'd be great to just have CTV as a sort of part of this proposal. And then the third issue where there's a little bit more kind of conceptual divergence between the three of us is, you know, AJ introduced a sort of more general mechanism, this op forward leap update, which we're calling op flu. And that like, that kind of allows you to build the specific op vault functionality, but it also allows other stuff too. And I think we're in the process of figuring out like what exactly that other stuff is and what it buys you. Because I'm I'm very hesitant to sort of generate, like I, I'd like to keep this proposal very targeted to vaults and I'm hesitant to kind of introduce like a sort of wide open op code that, you know, makes the proposal a little bit harder to, to reason about and harder to test. Yeah, so actually I'll stop, let people ask questions. Yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, recap sort of what's going on, at least in, in my understanding. The initial op vault proposal from James involved a fairly specific use case, if you will, this vaulting use case, and it used two different opcodes. But the way that those opcodes were constructed, they were, I guess, bigger Lego pieces that had some logic to them that allowed some branching, I guess, the different ways to use those two different opcodes. And yeah, so yeah, go ahead. let me just, so there's two things that kind of, I didn't love about it. So one is the, it has a recursive script evaluation step. So in the when you're doing the initial triggering for the unvault, basically you do it, you're stuffing another program and then running that as the call authorization step. So it'd have like, you know, a check sig or a multi-sig or time locks, wh whatever you want in there. But it's a recursive evaluation. So you have the script interpreter and then you're doing another script interpreter inside. It's limited to one recursion step, but it's not quite as composable or elegant in my opinion. And then the second is just the dual purpose of these opcodes, just, to me, made it harder to reason about. That's it. Well, yes, that's all right. I want to push back on the idea that it's not as composable because I think in practice it actually is because like anything that could have lived as, you know, a sibling tap leaf or whatever, that could have lived in the sort of recursive script that you're that you're embedding. But I agree totally that it's a much cleaner approach well, to use so that. I would push back in the sense of, yes, for that step, the expressivity is probably equal. But for example, I can't think of a really clean way to do mini script where I think if it's all one level, the mini script story gets a lot simpler. That's kind of what I'm thinking of from a wallet developer standpoint. Yeah, that may well be. I hadn't thought through mini script at all. But so yeah, it, you can continue, Merch. Yeah. In the process of evaluating these original opcodes, it sounds like the simplification, if you will, of, of putting the features into individual three individual 
opcodes has not only decreased some of the complexity, but also spawned this discussion about more generalized ways of using these smaller Lego pieces to build non vaulty things. And that's where CTV, it sounds like, comes in a bit. And so it's, it sounds like the scope has, James, maybe expanded a bit on this proposal, would you say? So, it, yeah, it's a little bit, the CTV issue is a little bit orthogonal to all this stuff. So it's a little bit of a shame that it got rolled in, but it's just kind of, the, we all simultaneously realized as we were talking about this, like, oh yeah, there's this TXID, my malleability thing with the existing proposal and CTV actually fixes that. So, so CTV can kind of be separated from the taprootification generalization discussion. But I want to remind people, I guess, that like, this gets a little brought politically because CTV was always kind of implicitly part of the proposal. One of the first, you know, discussions that came out of my initial proposal was Ben Carmen saying, hey, if you send to one of these op un outputs with a zero delay, you basically get CTV. And, and he's right. And he was excited about using that for DLC efficiency. So, you know, in a sense, like CTV has always been a part of the proposal. It's just, we all kind of realized that, well, actually Jeremy put a lot of thought into how to avoid malleation and, you know, we should just call a spade and actually make use of CTV. And I mean, take advantage of all the review cycles. It's had a lot more review cycles than whatever opcode I made up in a mailing list. Right. Mark. Yeah. So I guess the divergence, as James was saying, is more like how general would this kind of script forwarding part, this trigger part be? And I think I'll describe kind of two things. The discussion is still ongoing, but the two things we've seen that fall out of this is if you have a more general TLOV construct, you can have kind of arbitrary script forwards to the, in kind of a natural way, to the withdraw step. So that one one thing is you could add an extra authorization step on the final withdrawal. Now, I don't know if you'd necessarily want that, but that's just a side discussion. And then the second is yesterday I was sitting down, I was thinking, what if we wanted to use these primitives that AJ lined up to do essentially a time delay for withdrawal, so a, a rate limiting. So let's say you want a smart contract vault that only lets one Bitcoin get withdrawn a day. How do you build that? And I actually just rearranged the pieces and made it work, which is kind of interesting to me. So basically, there's this tension between targeting what we believe is an exact kind of idealized flow that we want to solve, which was James's proposal, versus giving smaller Lego pieces that might be able to be put together to do maybe alternative vault designs or other use cases. So that's the tension there. Emerges, yeah, does. I'm kind of wondering, so with CTV, a large part of the debate was that it was such a broad set of possibilities that it was really hard to delimit what you would be able to build with it. And that had some people worried. And now you guys saying that you want to use CTV basically as the spending step of the vault makes me think that you're going to inherit a lot of that debate. And I was wondering how you are thinking about that. Yeah. What do you Go want ahead, to handle this, Greg? Well, I could, yeah. Basically, w we already made an opcode that was like a bad version of CTV, and that was kind of our idealized functionality. So I think the pushback here would be that it is exactly the step we needed for the use case, right? So it's it's a composable piece of a whole, yes, but it's exactly kind of what we need. So that's my opinion. Yeah, I keep calling this like convergent evolution. I kind of didn't set out to design or redesign CTV. It's just, it kind of just happened to be exactly what was needed to make vaults work. You kind of just can't have vaults unless you can say ahead of time, hey, this pending withdrawal is going to this exact set of outputs. So, you know, again, that's all CTV does. Merge to your question specifically, you could introduce a very contrived constraint that says, okay, you're only able to use this CTV-like behavior if the output that you're spending is an op vault. I just think that would be kind of a shame because I think, you know, nobody who ever gave CTV the time of day from a technical standpoint ever came up with any class of pro probable risk around like, oh, you know, this usage is going to be dangerous. I think from the technical side, the objection was always like, oh, this doesn't go far enough or this doesn't, you know, nail any one particular use case. And I think when you have CTV plus the now, you know, reduced vault overlay, then 
you really nail this vault use case. And so I think it becomes a very compelling, you know, reason to introduce CTV as a prerequisite. But yeah, I'll be honest, I am really want vaults because I really think it's an important thing to have in Bitcoin. And I'm very sadly concerned with how CTV might drum up a bunch of... Yeah, to respond to one of the first points here, being able to spend any vaulted UTXO with a CTV output would just make people that want to use CTV vault their stuff before. So it just makes it more complicated to do the same thing. So from that standpoint, if you do want the full functionality of CTV, then CTV should just be a first class citizen. At least we then waste the redirection where people create extra transactions just to do exactly the same thing. But yeah, well, a lot of water has gone down the river since, but I am just thinking that, that might be a possibility that people get here that their CTV in your proposal under the hood and that triggers people just from past experience. Yeah, I think a lot of education, you know, or at least, you know, explanation is going to be required to, to basically say, hey, like from the genesis of this proposal, you know, this functionality was always in there. CTV is just kind of a different name for it. And so, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm gearing up to, to prepare myself for that. And I, I think that's why it's important, you know, that Greg and AJ and I continue to collaborate on this because, you know, if it's just a lone effort for me, I'll probably get overwhelmed. And, you know, I think that the chance of a functionality like this winding up in Bitcoin won't be as high. And personally speaking, I think this tech template verify thing would be very enlightening to me to see who's in it to build self-custody things and who's in it for kind of affinity scamming to put it kind of harshly. I think tribalism is toxic. And I was one of those people who said CTV didn't nail any particular use case. So I was kind of meh against it. But as a part of a larger whole, I, it doesn't make sense. And so I just, I really would, I'd say it's worse than a shame if it gets killed because of that. Yeah, I agree. And another point there is that, you know, AJ has a draft for like sort of a coin pools proposal. And I think maybe that's part of what's motivating this op forward leaf update stuff. But, you know, CTV is another part of that too. And so I just think this process of, of locking validation to a set of outputs seems to be this fundamental building block that we just kind of need to do interesting things with Bitcoin. Yeah. And AJ noted that, you know, so these core op codes or core vault functionality are doing two things, right? It's locking it's locking a script up, like output scripts, right? Saying this output must be this, but it's also doing value sweeping. So for the vault use case in general, it's like move all of this value minus maybe a refund or the revault amount. And so AJ really liked this as well. And I do too, the kind of this, it's simple logic seems to solve a number of use cases. Yeah. yeah and I must admit, it sounds good that there's now already multiple people starting to converge on a proposal. I think that was maybe something also that was hard about CTV was that it seemed to still have everybody debating on what you actually want, whether whether it means something. And here with the focal point being the vault, it sounds that approaching it from the point we want vaults and this might be a way to do them and then converging on a solution is a is maybe a way to to start talking about CTV again too. Totally. And, you know, actually kind of an interesting anecdote for me is back in the 2021 TabConf, there was a really great panel between Jeremy and Andrew Polstra about covenants. And, they, you know, they spent a lot of time more or less debating kind of the different approaches. And I asked Andrew at one point, so, you know, and of course I'm, you know, putting words in his mouth a little bit here. So my apologies if I'm kind of rephrasing this incorrectly, but I, I said, so, so do you have any sort of safety concerns with CTV? And he said, no, I think it just doesn't go far enough. And really, you know, for Bitcoin to succeed, I think it needs recursive vaults and CTV doesn't get us to recursive vaults. And that, like that sentiment really stuck with me. And that was almost the impetus for me to sit down and start thinking about, you know, okay, how can we do, you know, recursive vaults? Yeah. Anyway, I think my takeaway is, uh, focusing on how your solution solves a specific problem that you want to solve is going to be a better way of people about what you're trying to do. I think that will be easier to communicate. Totally. Yeah. So now in my mind, the big debate, the thing we got to sit down and figure out is how granular or like how small are the Lego blocks for this, you know, is op 
flu going to be a part of the story or not? Because I had made a summary post where I took Greg's work and I think we were able to whittle it down to two op codes. You know, op vault has this like T lovey special case behavior and then op vault recover handles the recovery and then op CTV obviously handles the final withdrawal. And I think AJ's sort of counter proposal or parallel proposal is to decompose those into formulations op forward leaf update and a few others. And AJ's accomplishes, is able to accomplish the vault design, but it's also theoretically able to do other stuff like Greg talked about this like rate limiting vault process. But I'm kind of curious, I guess what we should figure out now is number one, is there demand for this on-chain rate limiting thing? And that's like a, a discussion we could have here. I know Greg definitely has stuff to say there and I've got stuff to say. And then there are other, are there other usages of this op flu stuff? Because on the one hand, I really want to support other usages and I love the idea of general op codes. On the other, I don't want to endanger delaying vault for a, a substantially long time because now we're kind of considering these much more powerful or not much more powerful, but you know, just more general op codes. Yeah. So to chime in, I agree with all that. It's just a question of where on this little curve, right? So we have the thing that's the most jettified, right? The kind of most the closest to your idealized setup and then you have like steps along the way that does slightly more less jetty kind of more composable means like for example we could implicitly do op ctv right and save one witness bite but that just confuses that makes the spec more difficult the story a little harder to tell and so there's all these little steps along the way and then there's the kind of the far extreme and we have to decide or james has to decide or we have to decide as a community where we want to land on that yeah, definitely. Well, I think uh, we might not delve too deeply into that discussion because I'm not sure how many people have thought about it enough to have a strong opinion yet. But from what I gather, we mostly covered the news. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I think it's a great discussion. It does seem like there's a lot of energy here and it would be nice to figure out a venue when the time is right that this could be discussed further. Obviously, the mailing list is the canonical place for that, but I'm wondering if at some point it would make sense to have AJ on spaces here with us and chat more about it. Obviously there's developer meetings and things like that as well, but it does feel like there's some good momentum and it would be nice to help move it along in some capacity as Optech the entity as well. Yeah, I think we're still in the space of what's technically possible, like with reasonable opcodes, I'd say. And then the second step would be like, what other people think? And that needs to be a larger group of people. James, Greg, or Merch, anything else before we move on with the newsletter? No, thanks for having us, and it's always good to talk about this. Excellent. Well, thank you both for putting your time and attention towards these interesting problems and coming on and discussing them. James, as an aside, it seems like you've been very intellectually honest and receptive to feedback throughout your proposal process here. And so I think that's very admirable. So I just wanted to put that on a personal note that you're not being defensive about the, any of these approaches and, and taking a lot of feedback. And I think that's valuable. So thank you. Of course. You guys are welcome to stay on. Obviously there's lots of work to be done and more discussions to be had on this. So if you need to drop, it's understandable. We're gonna go through the rest of the newsletter. And if you wanna hang on and chime in, feel free to do that as well. One of the following items is inquisition, which seems somewhat related to software proposals. So maybe you'll have some thoughts on that too. Yeah, I'm sure we could use some insights. One quick other news item before we move on to that inquisition PR review club item is we did announce via Twitter last week about these spaces being bundled up into a podcast and getting transcriptions. But we also then had a, a coverage in the Optech newsletter this week and a special blog post that formally announces that as well. And so we actually have last week's Twitter spaces transcribed and ready to go. We have a good flow with some different vendors doing the audio editing and the transcription process. And I think it's valuable as you can see with discussions like we're having today with Greg and James that to try to get some of that down. So it's in the archives for people to review, whether that's in a few days or in a few years, it's valuable to have these experts talk about their perspectives and capture that. So I'm glad we're able to do that. And thank you to James and Greg and the other experts who have lent their time to this. Oh, I just want to say thanks for having us. I think this is a great venue for, you know, somewhat casual, but still kind of in the weeds topic. So I'm really glad you guys do this on a weekly basis. Awesome. 
We have a monthly segment that we do for the newsletter, which is Bitcoin Core PR Review Club. And for those that aren't familiar, PR Review Club is a weekly IRC meeting in which some organizers get together. They prepare notes about a particular pull request, usually to Bitcoin Core, although I think in this week it's not technically the Bitcoin Core repository and then prepare questions and answers and background information about that pull request so that folks can join once a week and discuss, answer questions, hear how other Bitcoin developers are, are thinking about reviewing certain PRs, the approach to certain PRs. And it's also a good way if you're interested in the code base and trying to see where you might be able to add value is to jump into those PR review club meetings and you may be doing peer to peer one week or in this case, Bitcoin Inquisition, the next week. It's, it's a very lurker-friendly way to get familiar with the Bitcoin core code base. So take a look at that if you're interested in the technicals. And this month we covered Bitcoin Inquisition, and this was a PR by AJ Towns, and there was a change to Bitcoin Inquisition in terms of the activation and deactivation logic for testing different consensus changes. So AJ actually authored the PR and was the host for this PR review club. Larry was kind enough to do a write-up for the newsletter this week, and Merch has his hand up. Yeah, maybe we should first talk a little bit about what the Bitcoin Inquisition proposal or project is. Absolutely. So I think you can think of Bitcoin Inquisition as a staging ground for soft fork proposals. The idea is it's a custom signet where you can easily activate and deactivate software proposals in order to test how they may be used or how they play with each other too. So the idea is that AJ just runs a signet and anyone that wants to test a software proposal can code it up against signet, well, specifically against inquisition and then activate it there very quickly tested and deactivated afterwards when they're done testing so that they can, for example, try a second variant of the same proposal and see which one performs better and also give it global access to other people that want to play around with it. And Inquisition has a couple different soft forks already activated. And I think, James, you were working to also get Op vault added. I assume with some of these proposal changes, maybe that's on pause right now. Is that right? Yeah. So right now, I think AJ's got BIP 118, any prev out, BIP 119, CTV. And I've got a PR up for the version of Op vault that's described in the BIP. But obviously, yeah, with the changes that Greg and AJ have proposed, I'm going to go back to the implementation phase of that and do an implementation and then rework the BIP. But in the process, yeah, there will be updates to that Inquisition PR there. One interesting note is that, yeah, there are some differences with the way that Inquisition handles deployments. And so when you're implementing stuff for Inquisition, <laughs> it's a little bit hairy from a rebase standpoint because you've got your PR against Bitcoin Core and then you've got your PR against Inquisition and they have to be kind of maintained in slightly different ways. James, is Inquisition running on the default signet or a custom separate signet? from the one that's default in Bitcoin Core. Yeah, this was confusing to me. It's actually running on default Signet. And this works obviously because everything proposed for Inquisition is a soft fork. So only Inquisition nodes are kind of aware or able to handle the transactions that make use of the soft forks that are activated on Inquisition. Yeah, so you'll need a path from your node to the Signet mining node because of standardness relay rules, right? But once it gets there, it Every other node looks the same, looks, looks as before. Oh, that's a good clarification. Thank you. So I'm not sure if we should just go through the questions one by one or talk a little more generally about Inquisition. I think the main difference with Inquisition is how soft forks are activated and deactivated. A, we don't really have a deactivation mechanism for mainnet soft fork proposals at all. And B, given that it's only a test net, a valueless network specific to, well, stress test proposal. We can much more loosely activate stuff. So what do you think, Mike? Yeah, I think we can maybe touch on this first question a bit, which I think rolls into some of that, which is, well, why do we want to deploy consensus changes that aren't merged into Bitcoin Core? Why not 
merge them into Bitcoin Core and then test it on the Signet or Testnet or some such thing? That's sort of the first question that we highlighted from PR Review Club, which I think touches on the motivation for Bitcoin acquisition in general. Merch, do you want to take a crack at answering that? Sure. So if you merge a soft fork proposal to Bitcoin Core, that generally means that you're touching consensus code. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a soft fork, right? And that is among the most sensitive things that you can change about the Bitcoin Core software. So if any bugs are introduced, that might even happen before the soft fork activates. So of course you could just have like a branch in which the soft fork lives, but to actually test it and to test it against especially other parallel proposals, you might want to A, merge the code into a code base together and B, like combine the forks or branches that have all these different soft fork proposals. And B, you really want to test what it looks like when it's running. So we can get all of that on a separate network much more safely than having that in Bitcoin Core. We have this notion of doing things on this inquisition, which is on the default signet. And then there's the question is, how do you deploy soft forks? And if there's a bug in one of these soft forks that you're testing, how do you undo it or update it with the updated soft fork code? And then how do you deactivate it if for whatever reason that soft fork isn't something that community decides to move forward with. And there's this new term, this heretical deployment. And that's what's the crux or the meat of this PR that was reviewed at PR Review Club is implementing this heretical deployment. Merch, I don't know if we want to get into the details of the state machine, but do you want to provide just maybe a high level overview of what that deployment is and why that's different from what we do now? If we deploy something on the mainnet, we do want everybody, or at least the vast majority of nodes and hash rate to be ready to enforce the new rules. Especially in the past few years, we have been using hash rate as a coordination mechanism where nodes enforce the rules. And that way, if the majority of the hash rate enforces the new rules, we get a convergent network state where the, even if there's some miners that still mine by the old rules and might actually mine a block that is invalid according to the new rules, we will always end up with a best chain that is composed of blocks that are valid according to the new rules. So on Signet, we only have a permission set of authors that write blocks. They just sign off on the blocks, that's why it's the Signet, and therefore, we already know exactly how much of the hash rate is going to sign off on blocks, namely the signet operators anyway. So we can have a much simpler activation process where they basically just mine a single block that tells all the inquisition nodes when to update. So they, instead of having a long process in which hash rate slowly over time starts signaling readiness, the signet operator just mines a single block that has the activation flag, and then 432 blocks later, the proposal activates. That's about three days, and I guess on signet because the blocks are just signed into existence and probably are exactly every 10 minutes, that's exactly three days. Okay, so then you have an activated soft fork on inquisition. Now, what considerations are there around, oh, this, soft fork has a bug, it's been identified by the author, it's been fixed. How would you go about remedying that in the inquisition model? Yeah, here we get this new state in the state machine, which is to deactivate and or deactivating. So instead of leaving a soft fork in existence forever, as we want that on mainnet, and maybe even burying it eventually, we allow for a path to go from active to abandoned, and the same process as for activation happens. The signet operator just mines a specific block with the signal, and then I believe also 432 blocks afterwards, the proposal is deactivated and goes to its final state abandoned. In that deactivating state, am I right in understanding that the point of that and not just going from active to abandoned is to give 
folks an opportunity to withdraw their funds from this soft fork before it's deactivated or abandoned? I mean, Signet funds, of course, are worthless, but I think the stated idea is it gives people a chance to clean up the UTXO set so that there is no outputs that are encumbered by those rules anymore. So if people are actually broadly testing some inquisition proposal, the stuff wouldn't live in the UTXO set forever. There's a question here about taproot being buried, and I think it might be an interesting thing to maybe highlight. Why is the taproot soft fork the one that's being highlighted in Inquisition as one that needs to be buried? What about other soft forks that have occurred? Merge? So let's talk about what burying a soft fork means. Basically, a soft fork is always a introduction of additional rules that restrict the set of allowed blocks. So for a node that follows the previous rules, a soft fork will create new blocks that are more restricted and therefore will always be valid to old software. We call that forward compatibility and that ensures that we do not split off nodes that are not upgraded yet, but that they just continue to follow along with the best chain. When we activate a soft fork, usually they use some form of new transaction construction or other rules that are generally forward compatible. So if there were very few instances of where those rules were broken before, we can just act as if the rules were active since the Genesis block and encode those few exceptions as exceptions in the block parsing. So for example, for Taproot, there were a few test transactions where people sent money to version one SegWit outputs. And if you hard code those exceptions, I think it's six transactions, then you can act as if Taproot were active from Genesis. And that way we can take out the activation logic and the special logic that Taproot is only supposed to be enforced from a certain height and make Bitcoin Core just enforce it from the get-go with the exception of these six transactions where it doesn't apply. So in this case with, with Inquisition, in Inquisition, all soft forks have a timeout. So from the get-go, when they're activated, they'll only last for some duration. And if Taproot were also activated as a, well, Inquisition proposal, a heretical deployment, then it would only last for some short period of time and it would have to be activated again and again. I'm mostly making this up from what I've read in the PR review club. <laughs> but anyway, by burying in Taproot, we just can have it part of the regular node behavior and don't have this behavior where it times out. And is part of the reason that Taproot needs to be buried in Inquisition is the fact that Taproot is not buried in Bitcoin Core currently? That's an excellent question. I'm not 100% sure. I think it's not buried yet in, in Bitcoin. <laughs> Okay, so Inquisition needs to handle that special case. I guess my assumption would be if, is if Taproot was buried in Bitcoin Core, we wouldn't need to be burying it in Inquisition, but further research for the users and listeners here to determine if we're correct on that. Merge I think that oh, that mostly happens roughly like half a year to a year after a soft fork has been active or maybe even later because you want to make sure that everything went fine, that the node has wholly accepted and moved over to the new rules. Merge, we can move on to releases and release candidates for this week. We've covered Core Lightning 23.02 release candidates for some time, including a few weeks ago where we had some of the Core Lightning team on that gave a little bit more detail about these different features. I think it is worth it to call out a few different of these features in a high level right now, which is Experimental support for peer storage of backup data, which is an interesting feature. I think something that is valuable to the network. And then also experimental support for dual funding and offers. Merch, what's peer storage backup data? Yeah, that's a pretty nifty little trick. Essentially, you to do something like the static channel backup, and you hand that in encrypted form to every single channel peer of yours. So anyone that you have a channel with, will offer to store some, I don't know, less than 50 kilobytes of data for you. And you encrypt that. So every time you reconnect to these peers, they will first hand you this little backed up data and right after the handshake. 
So that way, if you lose your channel state, when the channels are closed, they go to the predefined payout addresses. And that's included in the backup that every single peer of yours has. And because the peers give you these, whatever, 50 kilobytes, every single time you reconnect to them, you don't really have to ask them for it and make them aware that you might have lost your channel state, but they just give it to you automatically and you know who your good peers are that way. And you always get regain access to your static channel backup. So this is notably not the full backup of the states of the channel, but it's more if the channel gets closed and you get paid out, you'll get back your money. The next release that we covered this week was LDK 0.0.114. And there's a, a couple different things that we noted. One is the security related bugs. And if you jump into the release notes there, I think we've discussed this in previous weeks, but there's a few different security fixes. One with pending unfunded channels. One is with channel ready messages causing issues. And then there's also a division by zero issue that's also resolved. So that those kind of roll up into the security related bugs. And then there's also support for parsing offers. Now LDK does not fully support offers yet due to not supporting blinded path at this time, but you can parse offers with LDK now. So it's getting closer. Merch, any LDK commentary? No, I think you got it. We highlighted the BTC pay 1.8.2 release. I think we've discussed previously that BTC pay does uh, pretty quick release cycle. And so really the bulk of the features that we noted in this release are from the 1.8.0 release, which was actually last week. So they've gone through a few different releases since then. And the features that we highlighted are custom checkout forms on BTC pay, some additional branding options, point of sale views, and then there's some address labeling. And I wasn't able to see, I don't know if you saw this merge, the address labeling, is that compliant with the new address labeling BIP or not? Did you happen to see that? I haven't looked into that, sorry. Okay, I couldn't see that, but perhaps they are adopting that new BIP fairly soon after it was official. The last release we have for this week is LND 0.16.0 beta RC2. I didn't pull out anything notable in this release to, to discuss. You're welcome to look at the release notes about this RC merch. I'm not sure if there's anything that you saw from this LND RC that was notable for their listeners. No, I have not. But I recently learned that there is movement on offers for LND. And I think that it might be notable to mention that they're aiming in spring to add blinded path support. If I understand that correctly, there seems to be, well, anyway, they're aiming, they're working on it now. <laughs> yes, there is a roadmap on the repository. I think a visual representation of the roadmap. I don't have the link handy to share here in the spaces, but if you look, you'll be able to find that. We're jumping into the notable code and documentation changes section of which there's only one. So I'll use this as an opportunity to solicit any questions or commentary from the listeners, feel free to raise your hand, request speaker access, and we can get you after we wrap up this LND PR. LND 7462, allowing the creation of watch-only wallets with remote signing and the use of stateless init feature. Um, my understanding is this is actually a bug fix that you were able to create watch-only wallets with remote signing previously using the RPC, but the option for the stateless init was not provided. So this PR adds that. And I'm not completely sure of the permissioning system of LND, but I know they use macaroons. And I think the stateless init feature does not save those macaroons to disk. It sends it back via the RPC for the client to store that information. Merch, did you jump into this LND PR at all? Just roughly to the same level as you. Yes, it sounds like a bug fix. And basically the idea is that it allows you to have a hardware wallet or a separate machine that signs off lightning interactions, or that's at least my take. <laughs> Thank you all for joining. Merch, thanks to my co-host. Thanks to James. Thanks to Greg for joining us. And we'll see you all next week at 1400 UTC to discuss newsletter 242.